Puerto Rico is not even in the biggest list of priorities to the U.S. And for Puerto Ricans, we have always been expecting, fantasizing, that we will at some point have the interest of Americans. July 4th, 1776. 13 colonies stood up against the British Empire and declared their independence. On the Declaration of Independence, they wrote that all men are created equal, with certain unalienable rights, that amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government. In the document, the colonies accused the British Empire of cutting off our trade with all parts of the world and for imposing taxes on us without our consent. The 13 colonies fought and won their independence, creating a new form of government. The United States of America, along with the stars in its flag, have evolved and expanded several times in its history. In 1898, 122 years after declaring its independence and refuting colonialism, the United States invaded Puerto Rico as part of the Spanish-American War. After the war, for the first time, the American flag is raised beyond the continental United States. Before this point, the United States Constitution never had to provide for territories. During the first decade of the 20th century, the Supreme Court is faced with the question, does the Constitution follow the flag in what is referred to as the insular cases? In a series of decisions, the answer was, not necessarily. And the courts create new terms to administer the territories, incorporated and unincorporated. At this point, Puerto Rico is defined as an unincorporated territory. In 1917, the people of Puerto Rico were granted U.S. citizenship, but they have no effective representation in the U.S. government. Early in the 20th century, the Puerto Rican identity is directly threatened by policies of assimilation. Even the island's name was changed from Puerto Rico to Puerto Rico. In their shared history, the U.S. has played the role of savior as well as the aggressor for Puerto Rico, dividing the political aspirations of the islanders. During the first half of the 20th century, there were many attempts to decolonize Puerto Rico in the direction of independence. But independence efforts in Puerto Rico by violent means were unsuccessful. In 1952, the people of Puerto Rico, led by the island's first elected governor, Luis Muñoz Marín, drafted the island's constitution and reached an agreement which would evolve the colonial rule over Puerto Rico into a more sublime colonial relationship called Commonwealth or Estado Libre Asociado in Spanish. The Commonwealth Constitution was approved by over 80% of Puerto Rican voters. For decades, support for Commonwealth Party kept growing virtually unopposed. After years of political persecution, the Independence Party loses support. As the independence ideal is in decline, the statehood dream is on the rise. Statehooders, or Partido Nuevo Progresista, adopted the mantra, statehood is for the poor, and rally about inequality and welfare funds. Knowing the strong divisions on the island, and mindful of the international opinion voiced through the United Nations Decolonization Committee, the United States adopted the politically correct policy of supporting self-determination for Puerto Rico. Following the examples of Hawaii and Alaska, the Puerto Rican statehood supporters promote the organization of plebiscites on the question of status. The first of these plebiscites is in 1967, and Commonwealth wins by a large margin. The second plebiscite is held in 1993, which marked a clear rise in the statehood movement. In less than a decade, statehooders decided to run a third plebiscite in 1998, but this time the options were different. Commonwealth was presented as a territorial status. This ballot also marked the first time the free association option, or sovereignty, was presented to the people. Statehood was presented on the third column and independence on the fourth. Commonwealthers disapprove of the definition of Commonwealth as territorial status, 
and created and advocated for a fifth option, none of the above, which won. In 2012, Republican governor and statehood supporter Luis Fortuño passed a bill to celebrate the fourth plebiscite in the island's history. But this time, tired of losing against Commonwealth, the statehood forces have aligned themselves with the Independence Party to ask a different question, one that the people of Puerto Rico have never been asked before. Do you agree that Puerto Rico should continue to have its present form of territorial status? Yes or no? I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. A large part of Puerto Rican life is what we call the status issue. What would be Puerto Rico's ultimate political status? Statehood, independence, or maintaining commonwealth, which is the current status? I have lived half of my life in Puerto Rico and half in the US. And if there's one thing I've learned about North Americans, it's that no one has explained the status issue and how it affects them. Did you know that Puerto Ricans are American citizens? Uh, no, I guess I didn't. Puerto Rico is the oldest colony in the world, and colonialism is undemocratic. So how does it feel to be colonized? What should we do about it? When we look at the status issue from Puerto Rico's internal politics, it looks like a conversation. But in reality, this conversation is merely the internal monologue from only one of the nations at play. The conversation needs to take place between both nations, Puerto Rico and the United States. Changing Puerto Rico's political status will have a deep and wide impact in American politics economics, and culture. My intention is to bridge the gap between both nations and bring the American people into the conversation. In 2012, for two weeks leading up to the vote and the general election in Puerto Rico, I spoke to the most influential voices on the status debate and asked them to convince me on their status position. My first question was always the same. Is Puerto Rico a colony? Puerto Rico is a colony since 1492. For 400 years under the Spanish rule, and since 1898, when the United States invaded Puerto Rico as part of the Spanish-American War, it became a USA colony. It's a colony in the most basic and elementary sense. Obviously it is. Yes, indeed, Puerto Rico is a colony. Puerto Rico has a colonial status. It's called the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, but it is legally an unincorporated territory of the United States. Puerto Rico is not a colony. That was decided by the UN in 1953. Since then, uh, people who are detractors of the Commonwealth concept have tried to put Puerto Rico on a list of colonies, but they have failed. That was a very controversial vote in 1952. It was really one of the first times that the uh, United Nations was addressing the political status issue. Uh, the United Nations did not say, and the United States did not say, to the United Nations when that occurred that Puerto Rico was no longer a territory. I think the concept of a territory has been deeply misunderstood. I don't think a territory per se defines a status. Within the U.S. system, you have Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, you have Guam, you have American Samoa. The three have very different statuses. Puerto Rico has a constitution our internal powers derive from the people of Puerto Rico. You could say that a colony must contain an element of, of economic exploitation by the metropolis. Well, that doesn't happen here. You can say that a colony is a place that's ruled by laws that do not derive from the consent of their people. Well, then you move closer to the uh, what we call the Commonwealth, we at the Commonwealth Party call the main defect of Commonwealth, that we do not participate in federal legislation. Puerto Rico has taxation with a representation today. I have data that suggests from the IRS that indicates over the last five years at least, Puerto Ricans have paid on the aggregate more than $3 billion in taxes. 2009 and 2010, residents of Puerto Rico paid more federal taxes than the residents of the state of Vermont. Puerto Rico today is a post-colonial colony. Colonialism hasn't always been the same. There is the colonialism of Puerto Rico between 1898 and 1948, the, the, the end of World War II. 
And Puerto Rico was the poorest country in Latin America and the Caribbean. The Americans do not want to let go of Puerto Rico and therefore they afford Puerto Rico a measure of self-rule with the elective governor in 1948. In 1952, they allowed Puerto Ricans to draw their own constitution. So I wouldn't call it a colony, but it does not have the same rights as states. It is basically an unfair political relationship, which does not give Puerto Rico the representation that a state has in Washington or the independence that an independent country has. I don't like to waste my time in all those legal discussions whether we have a totally democratic relationship with the United States, my answer will be, say, will be no. Whether we have now a better option than state or independence, my answer will be yes. Do we need to improve this relationship in order to make it more fair and more democratic for the people of Puerto Rico? My answer will be yes. Ellos no llegaron aquí con plebiscitos ni los cuentos estos. The United States invaded Puerto Rico because they needed to protect the eastern gate of the Panama Canal. The western gate was protected by Hawaii. When the United States took Puerto Rico from Spain, it also took the Philippines and Guam. There was a very clear feeling in the federal government that it did not want to make statehood a clear option for Puerto Rico because then it would have to explain to the Philippines that it did not want statehood to be an option for the Philippines. And I don't think many people in Puerto Rico appreciate that either. The United States government decided in 1916 that the Philippines would eventually become independent. Right after deciding on independence for the Philippines, the U.S. Uh, government extended citizenship to Puerto Ricans. Puerto Rico is the first jurisdiction in which the U.S. Congress granted to U.S. citizenship, but not as part of a process of making Puerto Rico state actually. There is a State of the Union uh, speech by uh, President uh, Taft in, in 1912. He specifically said this has nothing to do with making Puerto Rico a state. And since 1898, the United States have been very clear. The objective of Puerto Rico, the mission of Puerto Rico, is not to become a state of the Union. That is why the Supreme Court in the insular cases at the beginning of the century decided and defined the relationship with Puerto Rico as an unincorporated territory that belongs but is not part of the United States. The difference between incorporated and unincorporated is that the incorporated are going to eventually become a state of the Union. For example, Hawaii and Alaska, they were incorporated territories. Puerto Rico is not. The key element of the post-1948 decision in terms of public policy towards Puerto Rico is the fact that Puerto Rico would be better off than their neighbors, but not necessarily equal to the states. And if you look at the path of Puerto Rico in terms of economic development, in terms of political development, from 1948 to the present, it has been one where Puerto Rico has been elevated above its neighbors in terms of the standard of living in terms of income, but it is still not equal to the United States. Congress cannot favor Massachusetts versus Texas because the Constitution of the United States is very clear that you have to assign funds proportionally to the amount of residents. That rule does not apply to territories. So they can give Puerto Rico 10 times more, which is not the case, or 10 times less. Puerto Ricans are only exempted from federal taxes when Puerto Rico's residents generate income locally. The status of Puerto Rico is not an economic issue. It's not an economic problem. It's just a human rights problem that has economic implications. The Stockholm Syndrome is used to, to explain the situation of someone who has been kidnapped and is kept under those conditions for a certain amount of time, and it has been used as a metaphor to explain the situation in Puerto Rico. The problem with that understanding is that it places us, Puerto Ricans, in the positions of victims. When you're placed in the position of victim, then you can identify someone who's been placed in the position of the predator, of the aggressor, but then you're expecting from, for someone to come and become your savior. That doesn't create the conditions for us to be 
in charge of our political destinies. We have to move away from that position of victims and become people who actually decide what is it that, that we want. The effect of, uh, of colonialism over Puerto Rican people has been one of identity crisis. We are not a, a, a nation state, but we are a nation. We are a nation without a state. Puerto Ricans are a Latin American nation. Puerto Rico is a, is a country, one of the only remaining ones in the world, uh, where the most important applicable legislation is made by the legislature of another country without our participation. There is a judiciary appointed by the president and the congress of another country that applies uh, those laws in Puerto Rico. The citizens of Puerto Rico have no say at all uh, in those decisions made by that other country. So it's a colony in the most classical sense. I think the Puerto Rican paradox was best illustrated by a decision in the Supreme Court in the early 20th century, which declared that Puerto Ricans were foreign in a domestic sense. That is, we're foreign people because we, we speak Spanish as our vernacular, which is a foreign language. We are a Latin American nation but we are domestic in so much as we are a possession of the United States or a colony of the United States. We cannot have treaties with the United States because we are not sovereign, we are a territory. And as a territory, we have to go to Congress and plead and beg for things that would help the economy. That is not a dignified situation for a country in the 21st century. We cannot say as a country that we have founding fathers. In most histories in the world, you get countries in which you can identify clearly founding fathers. And founding fathers are people who are willing to sacrifice, make choices, political and ethical choices, to do things putting everything at risk, even their own lives. Contemporary political history in Puerto Rico show in reality, our so-called founding fathers were never willing to take those risks, but actually were creating political conditions through which create a political project without taking significant risks. Colonialism is about not taking risks that countries all over the world actually take. We're a commonwealth because it's convenient, not because it's doing anything good to us. We are more like a, like a benefit to them. They use us. As a culture, we can't progress being a colony. We're constantly bombarded with all the influences from the United States, with all the media from the United States, with all the political terminology of the United States. Nos han criado con esa en la mente, realmente, de que Estados Unidos es nuestro papá. Somos un país insularista en donde nuestras costas nos limitan y la única costa que existe es Estados Unidos. Because of their policies and because of our status, because of the money they've poorly invested in us, we are in this economical and cultural turmoil. Puerto Rico is now suffering from the same things that uh, the United States suffered before being the United States as a colony. El puertorriqueño sí, yo entiendo que se siente colonizado, pero el miedo a, de, a, a dependerse o a desprenderse de esa colonización nos lleva a permanecer en este estatus. General election and the fourth plebiscite. On the surface, it looks like a celebration. People are excited and emotional. Many have called Puerto Rican politics our national sport. We have the green team, red team, and blue team. Unlike the United States, Puerto Rico is not divided politically by Republicans and Democrats. What defines our political parties is their position on the status issue. La independencia es lo que nos abre la puerta al mundo. Yo voy a votar que sí, porque esto es un embeleco. Bueno, que gane la estadidad. Para mí hay cosas más importantes en este país que en este momento el estatus. No hay dinero en Puerto Rico y eso no se puede tapar. Although traditionally Puerto Rico has had a three-party system, there are six parties campaigning for governor during this election. But not all parties are involved in this plebiscite. This plebiscite, that is supposed to help solve the colonial status, invites a lot of controversy. Now there's going to be a this vote in November 6th, which is a charade. We can discuss whether it's a charade, whether it's worthless. However, the plebiscite exists. No, uh, the November plebiscite is not 
a politically motivated event. It's just another attempt of the statehood party, and this time to do two things. Many statehooders are not happy with the governor, and he's running for re-election, so he's mixing an election with a plebiscite, which is the first thing that you have to avoid. Some people criticize me for having a vote on status on the same date and the election. These are the same people that criticized me when I suggested that we do it in August. So they're gonna criticize me regardless of what we did. Number two, it is not the first time that it has been done. And number three, you know, we all pay with our tax uh, money for that vote. So why not have it the same day and just have one process and, and get it over with. Making a decision who's gonna be your governor for the next four years is something different of making your decision about the next generation which is a decision about status. The plebiscite that's going to be held on November 6, it's an idea, it's a device constructed by the pro-statehood movement to guarantee an artificial majority for statehood. It might not work, but that's what's behind it. This is the ballot for the, the, the status plebiscite that will be held simultaneously with the elections on November 6. What will happen in the 6th of November it will be contradictory. This plebiscite is going to decide nothing. This plebiscite, I think it's very important for Puerto Rico because for the first time in our history, we are going to be telling the United States whether we want to maintain the current status with the United States. We can ask the question whether we want to stay as we are or do we want to change. The plebiscite this year, in 2012, it's a little bit awkward in the way it was, the bill was drafted. Who designed the ballot? Well, it, this went to the legislature, it went back and forth. Uh, it had a number of uh, amendments. And it has two parts, and they are non-binding. The first question says whether you want to keep the current status or not. The first question is simply a, a very straightforward one of whether Puerto Rico wants to remain in its actual condition uh, as a territory. That allows the people who are for the three alternative options to gang up on the Commonwealth concept. If the people say yes, I think that will derail again the whole status issue. Should the people decide that they do not want to maintain the present relationship, which of three internationally accepted options they want, whether integration into the nation through statehood, separation from the nation through full outright independence, or become a free associated state. Our hope, of course, is that the people of Puerto Rico will, for the first time in 112 years, have the opportunity to reject colonial status. That is to say, the election is not merely going to be about status alternatives or not merely about political parties and candidates. There's also going to be this, this question. This is why the Puerto Rican Independence Party has strived so strongly to, to get this vote on the ballot, because we are sure that the majority of Puerto Ricans, that is to say, theoretically, all statehooders, all independentistas, and even those populares who might want some sort of a relationship with the United States, but not want a relationship that, which is uh, subordinated, that is colonial in nature. And that surely is a great majority of the people of Puerto Rico. So all the state of people want to do is to be able to add the independence votes to their votes and defeat Commonwealth, and then have the matter decided among the least favored, historically least favored options. I think that two things are going to happen. Number one, people are going to use that ballot, the status ballot, to vote against Fortunio, to show how mad they are at the fact that he's using status to mix it with the general election. But the other thing I think is going to happen is that people are going to reject statehood over there and look for ways to show their support for Commonwealth. They will raise every excuse possible to deny Puerto Rico the right to vote on political status, and there is a reason. Support for Commonwealth status, for the territorial status we now have, has gone down from 70% in 1952 to less than 50% today, while support for statehood has gone up from 12% in 1952 to around 50% today. In 1993, statehood grew significantly with 46% of the vote. Commonwealth got about 48% of the vote, and independence got again less than 5%. What is interesting is that you anticipated growth, I mean, from 36% to 46% in, 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 in a few decades, uh, the statehood movement was up and coming. Yet in the 1998 plebiscite, statehood got 46% again. 
it did not grow. If 50% plus of the people in that plebiscite say, yes, I want to become a state, we will then be able to, for the first time, present our first credible request for statehood. And a demand on the United States to, to stop exercising colonial power uh, over Puerto Rico. That is to say, to force them to assume a position on the question of Puerto Rico and to discharge their, their obligations. We don't think that's fair. We think that's an illegitimate uh, process of self-determination. In terms of what's going to happen in Washington, nothing is going to happen because this is not really a legitimate self-determination process. Puerto Rico will have become a tyranny if the United States continues to insist on a colonial relationship when the majority of Puerto Ricans have refused it. This plebiscite that is proposed and it's, been, it's going to happen in November 6th doesn't even follow the Obama administration recommendation. This plebiscite has, hasn't been legitimated by anyone in Washington. The ballot and the questions on the ballot are consistent with uh, the report issued by the White House. What will happen the 6th of November will have no impact whatsoever in the U.S. And in Puerto Rico, when you combine the results of the election with the result of the uh, referendum, you will get most probably contradictory responses. And those contradictions are symptomatic of the political situation in Puerto Rico. What I wonder is what will happen if Puerto Ricans vote yes, uh, that they want to maintain the territory, and if they vote for statehood, that they want to change the territory. That would be interesting because that would be an oxymoron. My expectation is that it will be as confusing as the past one. It will not send a clear signal to Congress. It will send another confusing signal that we are not sure what we want. If the no wins, then it's a new ball game. It really doesn't matter in a way who is the governor of Puerto Rico because we will have a mandate from the people of Puerto Rico to tell Congress that we want to reopen the case of Puerto Rico. Options. One by one, let's explore the options the people of Puerto Rico face and understand the motivations behind each alternative on the ballot. The first question reads, do you agree that Puerto Rico should continue to have its present form of territorial status? Yes or no? The official position of the Popular Democratic Party in regards to this plebiscite Ask the people to vote yes on the first question and leave the second question blank. This is the case for Commonwealth. In Spanish, it's called Estado Libre Asociado, and in English, it's called Commonwealth. And when it was approved by Congress and by the Puerto Rico Constitutional Convention, both names were used. And that was a political decision made by Luis Muñoz Marina, who was the uh, first elected governor of Puerto Rico, creator of Commonwealth and all that. I will, with all due respect to Muñoz Marin, I will say that that perhaps was the start of the confusion because Estado Libre Asociado, if you translate it to, to English, it should be something like free associate state and he thought that the people of the U.S. and Congress will not understand that concept. And then he used Commonwealth, which is some sort of, it's been used, many of states are come the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which has a notion of self-government. And I think that, that part of the confusion started there, uh, that we said Commonwealth in English, and then we said Estado Libre Asociado uh, in Spanish. The trademark here in the island is Estado Libre Asociado. Commonwealth was a solution to a dilemma. For decades, the Puerto Rican people debated between independence and statehood. Both are classic options, but none seemed to adequately fit our concerns, our conditions, and our aspirations. So we created the Commonwealth status. Well, but there are people in Puerto Rico who support independence, and there are people in Puerto Rico who support statehood. So they keep the debate alive. But as far as we are concerned, Commonwealth continues to be the best option for Puerto Rico, and we are seeking to improve some aspects of it. Under independence, you guarantee your identity, for sure. But then you lose that uh, close tie with the U.S. and the U.S. citizenship. Under statehood, you guarantee the close relationship with the United States and, this, and the U.S. citizenship, but you jeopardize the uh, culture and identity. If you look at a quarter, it says a pluribus unum, which means from the many, one, that's the whole notion of the U.S., that once you become a state, 
Everybody has to be melted, even though we recognize minorities and all that. In the case of Puerto Rico, we, we're not like that. And you have symbols of, of what we are. For example, we have our own Olympic team. Some people say, oh, that's not that important. Oh yeah, that's very important. It's how you express yourself as a collective, and in this case, as a nation, and you will lose that. Although there's a debate whether that team would survive under statehood, I don't see how it can survive. There's a federal law, the Amateur Sports Act, that appears to prohibit that, to prohibit a state from having uh, international sports representation at the Olympic level. And uh, that's something that the Puerto Rican people value. There was a nation called Soviet Union, and there was a place called Yugoslavia, and a place called Czechoslovakia. And now they don't exist anymore. Why? Because those were countries made up of many nations, and at the end, those nations came back because they were never, never, never assimilated. If you make the commitment of being the 51st state, you have to make the commitment of assimilate your culture, your identity, and we don't want that. But it's a self-determination decision for the people of Puerto Rico. But then, in the turn of the U.S., one thing is to have a nation with many different cultures and minorities, and another is to become a multinational state. That's what, for example, Canada is. And you have the Quebec question. That's what Spain is. And you have right now the Catalonia question. That was what the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia were in the past. A political state with different nations within it. So offering statehood to Puerto Rico is a self-determination issue for the United States because it will be the first time that the United States will make making the decision, no more a pluribus unum. When I was a child, there was a very famous TV series. It was called Hawaii Five-0. The star of the uh, series was Maguire. My name is McGarrett, Hawaii Five-0. And I say this with all respect. He was a white American. He was the chief of police. All the chiefs were white Americans. And the street officers were the Hawaiians. That's what statehood means. And in the case of Hawaii, really what you have is the same thing with Alaska. Basically, there was assimilation before statehood. And that's not what we want for Puerto Rico. Nobody will ever accept that uh, if we become a state, the Secretary of Education will be a white American. Nobody will ever accept that. You can see it in, in history. You can see it uh, with New Mexico. You can see it with Oklahoma. You can see it in Louisiana, uh, where there were a French population in Louisiana. Hispanic population in New Mexico, several Indian or Native American populations in Oklahoma, and through time, they have become assimilated to a greater or lesser degree, and we think that would happen in Puerto Rico. The only argument they have is that under statehood, we will get more federal funds, and I have some problems with that. Everybody's following what's happening with the U.S. deficit, and to put and base the decision about your identity and your whole future in that we're gonna be getting more federal funds from the U.S. government when the United States is deciding right now we have to cut funds for every program. It's, it's like, you know, you're going against history in that term. You look at statehood, okay. That entails the application of federal taxation. Not only income taxes, there are gasoline taxes, et cetera. What impact would that have on our economy? That has been studied by the Congressional Research Service and, and the uh, General Accounting Office several times. And they all have concluded that, at least initially, it would have an adverse impact on our economy. When you look at independence, well, you have to pull out all the federal aid that we actually received, which are billions and billions of dollars, and model how our economy would work once you take those funds out. Free association, the same. That's, uh, first of all, we don't know what the deal would be with the United States, because that's not stated in the ballot. You can analyze whether the fiscal autonomy that we have now is a better tool than not having fiscal autonomy under statehood. And through that economic analysis, reach a decision as, which, as to which is the best status option. The people of Puerto Rico, and whenever they have had a chance to express themselves, they have said, they support Commonwealth. I would say they support both Commonwealth and they support both 
enhance or sovereign commonwealth or whatever you want to call it, which basically is, I want to keep my U.S. citizenship and my close political and economic relationship with the United States, but I want more autonomy for the people of Puerto Rico, more self, you know, more uh, powers for the people uh, of Puerto Rico. And I think this is a matter of political statementship. I think it's something that at some point the U.S. will have to sit down with Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican leaders, and say, yes, we can work different and enhance relationship with the United States under this concept. What Commonwealth achieved in 1952 was a recognition that our internal powers would be held in sovereignty rather than as delegated powers from Congress through organic acts, as had been the case until then. What remains unresolved is that even though we're subject to federal law, we do not participate in federal decision making. The Commonwealth idea has several solutions uh, to that problem, and that's uh, what we try to propose when we, want, when we talk about improving the Commonwealth. We need a mechanism where, even though Puerto Rico does not participate in federal de decision making, in federal legislation, we can opt out from those federal laws that affect us. One of the main advantages of Commonwealth over the states, or one of the powers that we have that states don't have, is our fiscal autonomy. All of our tax revenues go into the Commonwealth Treasury. If we became a state, we, were, we would have to share those revenues with the federal government. We can't really collect enough taxes now to meet our government's expenses. How are we going to be able to do it if we become a state. Puerto Ricans would be subject to higher tax rates, I mean, combine a state and federal tax rate. I think that would be devastating to our economy. We don't want that. As a commonwealth, we don't pay federal income tax. And that gives us an important economic tool because if I want to give incentives for films in Puerto Rico, and we actually do, you have a special tax structure for everyone who invests in Puerto Rico in the filming industry. And since we don't pay federal income tax, you can tell them, come and invest in Puerto Rico and you're gonna be protected. That's the way manufacture was developed in Puerto Rico from the 1940s to the early this 21st century. And that's the way we can develop and we start trying to develop other areas of our economy. I think as a Puerto Rican, I wanna remain a Puerto, as a, a Puerto Rican. I think the Puerto Rican people constitute a nation, and through the Commonwealth option, they've been able to preserve that. I think statehood has a big impact on that, and I think that's bad. I think uh, the diversity that the world has uh, enriches all of us, and to have a people assimilate into another people, I, I find that the entire world loses with that. I don't want to become something else. I want to remain what I am. I am a Puerto Rican. Commonwealth allows me that. The second question on the ballot reads, regardless of your selection in the first question, please mark which of the following non-territorial options would you prefer? Statehood, independence, and sovereign free associated state. Personally, I find it confusing that the people who voted yes on the first question are still being asked to vote on the second question. I think it would have made more sense if the ballot said, if you voted no on the first question, please mark which of the following non-territorial options would you prefer? But that's not how it was presented. The independence option is presented in the middle of the ballot with the image of Puerto Rico. The description reads, Puerto Rico should become a sovereign nation, fully independent from the United States, and the United States Congress would be required to pass any necessary legislation to begin the transition into independent nation of Puerto Rico. If you agree, mark here. Let's hear the case for independence. Creo firmemente la capacidad de mi pueblo y el derecho de mi pueblo a ser libre, y por ello lucharé hasta la muerte. Why independence? It's always better to, to have freedom than, than not to have it. Only in, in Puerto Rico would the question even arise in as much as independence means full self-government, truly full self-government. That is, of course, the only democratic status conceivable. The alternatives, that is to say, the alternative of statehood is an artificial alternative. It it's, has never been real because the United States may be a country that aspires to be multicultural. 
but it is surely not a country that aspires or is multinational. And making Puerto Rico a state is exactly the same as making Santo Domingo, Republic, Dominican Republic a state, or making Jamaica a state, or making Honduras a state. Uh, Puerto Rico is a different country in which Puerto Ricans are different nationality from the United States, and, and we are as different from the Americans as the Palestinians are from the Israelis or the Japanese from the Burmese. We are not independentistas because of material or financial concerns. We are independentistas because we just don't like foreigners ruling our land. More and more, independence is becoming uh, a material imperative. Uh, right now, uh, we are struggling with a different uh, world economy, and any advantage that the current status may have supposed in the last century, in the past century, uh, has completely disappeared by now. And so, uh, what we live right now is a status of economic stagnation, of poverty, dependency, and uh, there's no way uh, people can be happy with that and with the perspectives that the colony offers to us. Statehood developed into an aspiration for, for many Puerto Ricans only because they repudiated colonialism, but at the same time thought that the, that the doors or the, the path to independence was closed for Puerto Rico or was an impossible political uh, project. So statehood developed in that sense artificially. And at some point that bubble will burst and it will burst, of course, uh, at the moment in which the Congress of the United States is faced with some sort of a statehood petition, which, which might turn out to be quite soon. Ellos no están aquí para favorecernos, ni ayudarnos, ni nada de eso. Eso es una fantasía. Dicen que nosotros vivimos de ellos. Eso es falso. Ellos viven de nosotros. Ellos dejan aquí en Puerto Rico, digamos, 9 mil millones, incluyendo lo que nos deben del Seguro Social. Pero se llevan cada año más de 60 mil millones. Destruyeron nuestra agricultura. Nosotros producíamos café, caña, tabaco, frutos menores, en grandes cantidades exportábamos para afuera, destruyeron nuestra agricultura, ahora dependemos de la agricultura de ellos. Si bloquean los puertos norteamericanos, nosotros tenemos de alimentación 10 o 12 o 15 días. Tendríamos que coger la yola para Santo Domingo para alimentarnos. A statehood is nothing but a new level of colonialism because we're not Americans. We will never be Americans. We have a different, a distinct Latin American identity. We have a different nationality. We, uh, you know that image that the United States uh, uses the melting pot? That's a terrible thing. That means becoming something that you are not in order to mingle, to, to be part of that other country. It's a horrible metaphor, the, the melting pot for us, because it would mean the disappearance of our identity. Having a representation in beauty pageants is something important for Puerto Ricans. Miss Universe is actually a, an issue that is constantly addressed in the status debate. And of course, uh, Olympic representation, uh, what would be of our athletes. Uh, even the people who, who advocate for statehood, they are Puerto Ricans first, and then Americans second, and not for very patriotic reasons. It's mostly because they think that the only way to survive in economic terms is to increase dependency. And that's the other issue that the Americans have to face. Are they willing to accept a territory that right now is poorer than the poorest American state? Puerto Ricans have been conditioned, of course, to believe that the independence would be like jumping off the eighth floor with, without a parachute. That is classical colonial policy. I mean, that is uh, that was always the position of colonial powers as to their colonies uh, for, for 200 years. So it's not, not at all surprising that the United States has always used those arguments in Puerto Rico and that the, the, their local representatives have used them, used them also. Ellos nos han llevado a la dependencia, al síndrome de la dependencia. Ante nosotros nos valíamos por nosotros mismos. Tienen 648 mil puertorriqueños que sobreviven por los cupones de alimentos. Ellos nos han llevado a esa situación. Controlan la vida y la sobrevivencia de miles de puertorriqueños que se ven forzados a trabajar en el gobierno colonial. Ahí ya controlan miles de puertorriqueños. Estamos controlados. No hay libertad ninguna, es real. Esto no es democracia, esto es mentira. Aquí no se vota, por ejemplo, por el gobierno propio nuestro. El verdadero gobierno aquí es Wall Street, las megatiendas, el gobierno norteamericano. 
cualquier empleado de una agencia federal norteamericana tiene más poder que el gobernadorcito, que la Corte Suprema, que los legisladorcitos coloniales. Es una fantasía, un engaño que le tienen al pueblo puertorriqueño en esas condiciones. Tienes que entender, tienes que entender. No todo el mundo se atreve a confrontar los poderes, pero aquí también ha habido otra lucha y no, y no ha terminado. Aquí han existido los macheteros, se le ha confrontado. Aquí hubo la insurrección del 50, no sé si sabes de la insurrección del 50, en distintos pueblos de Puerto Rico se confrontó a los poderes norteamericanos, que ahí fue que dos puertorriqueños fueron a la Casa Blea, Oscar Collazo y Griselio Torresola. ¿Entiendes? Aquí se ha peleado, Puerto Rico ha peleado, pero nos tienen atrapados en esa situación. Independence is the only way to go beyond the separation from us and the rest of the world that colonialism has imposed. Right now, for example, Puerto Rico is unable to establish uh, commercial uh, relations uh, with any other country without the approval, of, the approval of the United States. Right now, we have to obey the laws uh, enacted by a foreign country that thinks, of course, in its particular interests. When a majority of Puerto Ricans declare through that ballot that we do not want to perpetuate the actual system of political subordination, then the United States, as a colonial power, will have to face to their embarrassment that they are exerting that power against the will of the people. And that is not an acceptable thing. That actually is tyranny. ¿Por qué se le tiene tanto miedo a la independencia y se aplaude la independencia de otros países? ¿Cuál es la fiesta nacional más grande en todos los países del mundo, incluyendo Estados Unidos? ¿Cuál es la fiesta nacional más grande? Su independencia. Su independencia. We will never cease to be independentistas. Now we advocate for independence. Uh, should that ever happen, which I doubt, would be then advocating for secession. And so the United States will have a Northern Ireland in their jurisdiction. They'll have a Catalonia, they'll have a País Vasco, they'll have Quebec. I don't think they want that. It's no wonder that in the world there are more than 200 independent nations and only one colonial Estado Libre Asociado. It's not that everyone else is dumb and we're smart. It's obvious that independence is in the, to the benefit of any country as a political status because it is the one that allows the widest array of tools and instruments to develop socially, economically and culturally. I mean, who would not want to govern themselves? It, it, it seems such a, such a basic proposition. Lo grande de tu pueblo y el mío, es que todavía hayamos puertorriqueños que creemos en nosotros mismos y que estamos orgullosos de quienes somos. Eso es lo grande, que todavía haya miles de puertorriqueños que creemos en nosotros mismos, en nuestro derecho a ser libres. El Estado de la Universidad es colonia. ¿Cuándo tú has visto una colonia soberana? O sea, es el mismo fantaseo que se trajo cuando crearon el Estado de Libre Asociado. Eso era la soberanía. Mire, Estado libre, asociado. O sea, un país libre, asociado. Estado libre, asociado. Y ni es ni una cosa ni otra. Pues ahora viene la invención. Mire, independencia ya. The statehood option is presented by the image of a star and the number 51 inside. The description reads, Puerto Rico should be admitted as a state of the United States of America so that all United States citizens residing in Puerto Rico may have rights, benefits, and responsibilities equal to those enjoyed by all other citizens of the States of the Union, and be entitled to full representation in Congress and to participate in the presidential election. And the United States Congress would be required to pass any necessary legislation to begin the transition into statehood. If you agree, mark here. This is the case for statehood. Statehood for Puerto Rico because it is a natural political status for any American citizen. Puerto Ricans have been American citizens since 1917. Puerto Rico has been under the American flag for 114 years. Guarantee equality for the American citizens living in Puerto Rico. Equal rights, equal responsibilities, and it would also guarantee the highest quality of life we could aspire to have. Do we get to choose our highest sovereign? The answer is no. Do we get to choose representation at the highest levels? The answer is no. Statehood will bring economic, political stability, and will give us seats at the table 
in Washington where decisions are made over our lives. For 114 years, others have been deciding for us without we participating at all. Under statehood, we would participate to the same extent as any other state of the union. Our men and women in uniform have defended democracy in our nation with valor and courage, oftentimes in greater numbers than most states. For 40 years, Puerto Rico has been lagging uh, the states in, in terms of unemployment, labor participation rate, and income. It's about time we stop uh, the migration that we're seeing. For, de for decades now, Puerto Ricans are leaving the island in the thousands, and they're not going to foreign countries in the Caribbean or Central America. They're going to the States, and they're going to the States because they're, they have equal rights and a better quality of life. That's why statehood is the way to go for Puerto Rico. It's a dignified status where we would not be depending on dole outs from the federal government and where we would be receiving participation in federal programs based on a right and not on, on falling on our knees and requesting assistance. And anything that would be taken away from us, it would be because it would have been taken away from every other state of the union. And anything that is given to us is given to us because it is a matter of right for all the other 50 states of the union. This is the place where everyone that aspires freedom and better opportunity for his or her children aspires to come to. We are citizens. So why can't we partake in that aspiration, the opportunity that the United States grants us, uh, and be excluded from that? As a state, Puerto Rico would have the same two senators that California has and that Rhode Island has. We would have five members in the House of Representatives with a vote, which our current delegate does not have. We would have seven electors in the presidential Electoral College, but more important than that, we would have a seat at the table where decisions are made. Right now, we have to pick from the floor whatever falls off the table. But the day that we're a state, as a presidential vote or as congressional representation, we will have a seat at the table. We have a lot of power because we would actually have the possibility of leading the Hispanic Caucus in Congress pretty much have the opportunity to lead the Hispanic voice nationally uh, in defense of the best interests of the Hispanic community. And it's time for us to either decide whether we want to join the union or we want to separate from the United States. And we think it's high time that people decide. And I think there are two, two roads here. One is statehood, which is to complete the process that started in 1898. And the other one is independence. And that will also complete the process. But in that sense, it will be to sever all relations with the United States. Clearly, most people want statehood, contrary to what may have been the, the case 50, 60 years ago. A very minute minority favors independence. Independence is a lofty ideal. I respect independence very much. The difference between independence and statehood is, is basically the quality of life that Puerto Rico would have, the, the economic development that Puerto Rico would have under statehood. Statehood would be a would give Puerto Rico an ideal platform to attract investment. There would be no political risk whatsoever if Puerto Rico becomes a state. And one of the basic obstacles we have in terms of economic growth in Puerto Rico is that we have a problem in um, bringing investment to the island. Our current political status uh, pretty much scares many uh, investors because they see us as international. Are they they're part of the U.S.? They're really not. Investors would be more secure, more confident in investing their money in Puerto Rico, which would ultimately create jobs, thousands of jobs for people in Puerto Rico. Will the United States uh, give a statehood? It's one of uh, uh, the questions of, uh, that's part of the fear tactics. I am a firm believer that uh, the only way to find out is to ask if you want to become a state or not. So not asking uh, just because of the fear that you will be rejected uh, is, is going to just keep us in limbo. When Hawaii and Alaska became states, um, the, the economies in both of those uh, former territories uh, uh, improved dramatically. Um, the same would happen in Puerto Rico. All property values, all assets in Puerto Rico would be worth a lot more if Puerto Rico were a state. 
I've always promoted the Statehood Act. I gave the choice to the Puerto Rican people back in 1998. I had hearings down there and um, listened to the people and listened to Carlos Romero, the horse. Uh, he got me started on this. But I've looked at the idea and I'm the last state that became a state uh, other than Hawaii when I say I live through the territorial concept. To me, I don't think Puerto Rico can uh, go forth and else they're a state or an independent country. Commonwealth to me is not the way to go. You cannot grow under the Commonwealth status. It is not the way it should be. In the history of the United States, 37 territories have asked to become a state. And 37 times it has been given to those territories. So let me make this point very clear. 100% of the times that a territory has asked to become a state, it has become a state. So there's no evidence to support the notion that the United States would reject Puerto Rico as a state. I, I don't think Puerto Rico would be a burden. I, I, that's one thing I have great faith in the Puerto Rican people. I believe they'll be a very industrious group of people and they will be able to bring forth maybe a new industry uh, and maybe a new concept as far as economic base. Uh, I look at bar in Puerto Rico as a, sort of a gateway to uh, export, import, uh, manufacturing, uh, those type things. The population is there. And when you become a state, I think you'd have more uh, permanency about investment. I may be wrong, but I think that's the way to go. Uh, we found a great, in, uh, much investment in, in uh, Alaska when we became a state, which we didn't have it before. Puerto Ricans pay the same, the same amount of Medicare tax as you pay in the, in the continental U.S. But when it comes time to reimburse that money to improve medical services on the island, as opposed to you and your state, your state receive 100% of what you pay in. Puerto Ricans receive 20 to 30%. That's not fair. The false arguments against statehood include uh, the, the falsity that we would lose our culture. And I think that we probably have our cultural traits more ingrained in ourselves than many fellow citizens in other states of the Union that perhaps do not have the same cultural identity that we have. I can tell you today that if Puerto Rico were to become a state, Congress could not take away our right to have Spanish as one of our two official languages. I don't think that our adding Puerto Rico as a, as a state will make the United States a multinational uh, country. We are a multilingual, multi-ethic, and multinational uh, entity already. It is not something new. Just go to New York City and there are over 80 languages and dialects that are spoken there. When people bring questions like the Olympic team, or the Miss Universe pageant uh, and statehood. I think people are missing the point. We have had uh, people from Puerto Rico that have competed on the U.S. Olympic team and had won gold medals, and we're proud of them. We have had people from the mainland that have competed in the Puerto Rico Olympic team and have won medals, and we're proud of them. This should not have anything to do with status. It is too bad that when we're talking about rights, basic civil rights, some people are trying to skew or, or, or uh, confuse the discussion of what are basic civil rights, like our quality of life. I am one who's always rooting for Puerto Rico, even when we're uh, competing against the U.S. The Olympic team and the Olympic committee is a private entity, and it's a, it has its own rules and regulations. If you look into the, the ruling of the international committee body, it does say very specifically, in terms of representation, it is up to the athlete and not the government. I, I guess the same could happen with Puerto Rico. Uh, it remains to be seen what the Olympic Committee decides the moment Puerto Rico becomes a state. The United States is an idea. You know, all of us that share that idea, those principles, uh, are Americans. I call us the new Americans. If we ever become a state, as I hope we do, I'll be a Puerto Rican American the same way there are German Americans, Irish Americans, Mexican Americans, Italian Americans, and I'll always be very proud of Puerto Rico. People that say that statehood is impossible because it will make the United States a multinational country either do not understand the United States or don't care to understand it. On the far right of the ballot, we find the sovereign free associated state option. 
This option is not to be confused with the current territorial status known as Estado Libre Asociado, sovereign being the key word. This option is presented by the image of a small Puerto Rican bird called Pitirre, which is known in Puerto Rican folklore as being small but brave. The option reads, Puerto Rico should adopt a status outside of the territory clause of the Constitution of the United States that recognizes the sovereignty of the people of Puerto Rico. The sovereign, free, associated state would be based on a free and voluntary political association, the specific terms of which shall be agreed upon between the United States and Puerto Rico as sovereign nations. Such agreement would provide the scope of the jurisdictional powers that the people of Puerto Rico agreed to confer to the United States and retain all other jurisdictional powers and authorities. If you agree, mark here. This option is not presented by any political party. Let's hear the case for sovereign free associated state. Statehood is available to all Puerto Ricans, not to Puerto Rico. The motto of the United States is e pluribus unum, out of many, one, not two, not three, not four. Puerto Rico is a separate nation. Puerto Rico is a Spanish-speaking Latin American nation in the Caribbean. The United States is another nation, and two nations that can have an extraordinary relationship that would benefit both parts. The central element now is that the current political status, Commonwealth as we have it, is no longer viable economically and politically. It was, and it was pretty uh, effective when it was created. First of all, we're in the 21st century. The re geopolitical, military, strategic reasons for the United States being in the Caribbean doesn't exist anymore. There's no Cold War anymore. The geopolitical center of the U.S. foreign policy is the Middle East and Asia, not the Caribbean, not Latin America. If you take, for example, independence, independence means it's nonsense today not in the sense of sovereignty, which I think it's adequate and it's needed, uh, but in the sense that we are living in an interdependent world. So why to defend the idea of independence in a country that is moving towards interdependence? But take the economic conditions of the US today. It makes no sense to become a state of a country that it's in decline. It seems to me that the free association option is not clearly understood in Puerto Rico, and uh, I think it requires a second look. The main thing is that there is no definition of free association. It's only what the parties negotiate. Almost anything can be negotiated as a uh, form of free association that would apply to Puerto Rico. I think it is in the best interest of the United States that Puerto Rico be a self-sufficient country that would depend less and less and less of any federal uh, transfers, that should be our north. That should be our aim. To maintain a relationship with the United States like the former territories in the Pacific. And allowing us to be the owners of our own destiny and creating the conditions to have uh, economic, political, international relations to many other countries while keeping a connection or a, some sort of association in agreement with the United States is the only feasible way out of this mess. There is no political party nowadays that is defending that, that option because they are incredibly fearful about that possibility. Why? Because the politicians in Puerto Rico, what they want is power. Their objective is to win the elections, not to deal with the status issue. Those who are really trapped in fear are the political elites, particularly those in the political democrat, the popular democratic party. The current situation where Puerto Rico is a welfare state dependent on the United States economically is not good. It's not good for the United States, it's not good for Puerto Rico. The terms of the Compact of Free Association negotiated with Palau, the Federated States of Micronesia, FSM, and the Republic of the Marshall Islands does not include citizenship, but that was their own option. They chose to be the citizens of their own countries. We therefore negotiated uh, an arrangement with them under which uh, they are able to enter the United States without a visa and to remain basically for as long as they want. Their status is not that of a, a permanent resident. 
It is something called a habitual resident. In effect, it allows them to come and go as they wish. They get a good deal of assistance from the United States, and because of their uh, unique status in the American system as freely associated states, they're also eligible for certain federal programs. Whether they could have acquired American citizenship and still be freely, freely associated is a problem which we never addressed because it wasn't an issue. Puerto Ricans in general, when you speak to them about that possible way out, they accept it. They understand it, it makes sense. I think we have to find a solution, and solutions are found discussing it. But you cannot have political agendas or personal agendas that I want to accomplish this because I want to uh, be in power. That should not be an option. We should not mix one thing with the other. One week to election. In the closing days of the campaigns, I went around to the different parties and talked to the people about their views on the status. Why independence for Puerto Rico? Because it is, it is an inalienable right. We, the independentistas, believe in the principles that made the U.S. Republic, which is liberty, justice, equality, and equal treatment to the human beings. So we are making a claim for the things that they fought against the English. And uh, it's not to be the enemy of the people of the United States, great people, but we have to achieve our own independence so we can be treated in equal terms. La tarea le conviene a los americanos primero, porque los puertorriqueños somos los primeros que vamos al frente y damos la cara. Necesitamos más dinero, necesitamos mejores carreteras, mejor educación. This is a civil rights uh, issue, and we are requesting equality as United States citizens who have paid our debts in every single war that the United States have been involved in. Yo quiero regresar a Washington llevando un mensaje claro de mi pueblo. Yo quiero un mandato a favor de la estabilidad. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, una colonia. Puerto Rico, un Estado libre asociado. No queremos ser el Estado. Quedarnos como estamos. Porque nos da la oportunidad de ser ciudadanos americanos sin tener que pagar contribuciones, sin tener que empeñar nuestra bandera y sin tener que empeñar nuestros valores patrios. A Luis Portuño lo vamos a detener ahora. Encaminarnos de una manera ahora hacia la estabilidad tiene consecuencias. Para votar con Puerto Rico, con Puerto Rico en tu corazón. Hay que defender nuestra bandera. Vamos a defender al Estado Libre Asociado. El próximo martes es el momento de rescatar a Puerto Rico. Election Day.
I voted for statehood. Yo voté por el sí y dejé las demás en blanco. Yo voy a votar que no. Voté por el no y por la independencia. Yo voté por la estadía. Voté no y la soberanía. Voté sí sin ningún problema. No a la colonia y sí a la estadidad. Es la independencia. La estadía. No a la colonia y por la estadía. Independencia. A la colonia sí a la estadía. Yo quiero Estados Unidos, la estadidad. Hay 50 estados. Puerto Rico hay uno solo. Statehood. We should be equal. Yes. Estado libre asociado. Estadidad. Por la colonia. Por la estadidad. La soberanía. Independencia. La estadidad. Y yo favorezco la estadidad. De la soberanía. Voté no y 51. No. Y voté por la independencia de Puerto Rico. It's very important for us to request to become a state, but it's also important for the United States to say that they want us to become a state. Quiero que Puerto Rico mantenga su relación como la tiene con Estados Unidos actualmente. Puerto Rico necesita dejar de ser un ciudadano americano de segunda clase. Nada que haga el partido nuevo progresista para mí tiene ninguna importancia. Yo entiendo que tenemos suficiente capacidad como pueblo de nosotros salir adelante sin necesitar que otro país nos venga a socorrer. Queremos llevar al Congreso nuestra gente para que nos defiendan allá también. For states or countries to make decisions, they have to have their sovereignty. If you don't have your sovereignty, you can take decisions. I consider myself a second-class citizen. We are taxed without representation. Somos un país dirigido por control remoto desde otro país. Definitivamente la estadidad no es una opción para Estados Unidos. Si yo quisiera ser francés, yo me iba a vivir a Francia. No le pedí a los franceses que me trajeran a Francia acá. Ya el Estado de Asociado como que ya no es necesario, ya no nos hace falta. Que en Puerto Rico nosotros tenemos el derecho y el deber de mandar en nuestra propia casa. Statehood means eh, equal rights, equal responsibility. People are just afraid to, to think of us as independent. Eh, no es que estemos en contra de ellos sino ellos son soberanos y nosotros también. Yo quisiera que esto fuera este, una estadidad ya. Los puertorriqueños queremos ser parte de esa nación, porque es la más poderosa y mejor, y donde la democracia está mejor en el mundo. Todavía estoy confundida con la pobreza del plebiscito. Si no resolvemos el estatus, no vamos a resolver nada. Our status, I think, has impacted our, our own identity. And because of it, we are very divided. Whatever the decision, we hope that it's for the best of uh, both the people of Puerto Rico and the people of the United States. Tengo que salir de este sueño Pero tengo miedo a despertar Trato de entenderlo en mis versos El misterio de mi estado actual On November 6th of 2012, the people of the United States held multiple elections and plebiscites. Many issues were at stake at the national and state levels. Barack Obama was re-elected to a second term. A shift in a more democratic and liberal direction took place in the USA. Maine, Maryland, and Washington each held plebiscites and approved same-sex marriage. Residents in Colorado and Washington voted to legalize marijuana. In Puerto Rico, Commonwealth supporter Alejandro Garcia Padilla defeated one-term governor, statehood Luis Fortuño, by a margin of less than 1%. Statehood supporter Pedro Berluisi was re-elected for a second term as resident commissioner of Puerto Rico. The Popular Democratic Party took control of the House and Senate of Puerto Rico. On the first question of the plebiscite on the status issue, 46% of the people of Puerto Rico voted yes, and 54% voted no. On the second question, the people voted in these numbers. 834,191 voted for statehood. 74,895 voted for independence. 454,768 voted for sovereign free association. And 498,604 left the second question blank. As expected, a controversy arised about how to interpret these results. The official percentage of votes statehood got was 61% of the vote. However, 
if you factor in the 498,604 blank ballots, statehood comes down to 44% of the vote. To make matters more complicated, the people elected a new governor who campaigned against the plebiscite and sent a rival resident commissioner to Washington. Which brings the question, did the people of Puerto Rico send a mandate to Congress? And just as important, what message did Congress receive? Washington, D.C. Puerto Rico is making history today. We are, are introducing the Puerto Rico Status Resolution Act. This is a bill that responds to the plebiscite held in Puerto Rico last November. In that plebiscite, the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico spoke loud and clear. 61% of the voters said that they don't want Puerto Rico to continue being a territory. They aspire to more. When asked to choose among the three options we have to the current status, the current territorial status, 61% chose statehood. The time has come for our star to shine along the others on the flag of the United States of America. The premise that Perluisi wants us to believe is that 62% of the Puerto Rico voted for statehood. That's just an outright lie. That never happened. Let's face it, in Puerto Rico, there's a great tradition of voting for ninguno de los anteriores. It's happened in the past. Puerto Ricans decided that they didn't like any of the alternatives. For any vote to take a place in Puerto Rico, I believe it carries more weight if it's a vote that's put forth by the United States Congress, because then people have to answer to it. But nevertheless, they held their own vote. It was confusing. Even here in the American media, I never saw a debate as to what it meant, the results. This vote, to me, seemed simple enough. It said, do you wish to remain in the relationship you're in with the United States, yes or no? Well, the easy way out for Congress is to say, well, there's no consensus in Puerto Rico until and unless there's consensus on the status, we're not gonna uh, get involved. But it's totally unrealistic to expect that there will be consensus on the status of uh, issue of Puerto Rico because you'll always have factions. You'll always have those who support statehood like I do, those who'd rather keep Puerto Rico the way it is, and those who advocate for independence. The question is, what the majority of Puerto Rico wants, because in any democracy, majority rules. There is a, a tradition in this country that statehood is awarded to an aspiring territory only when there is something called a consensus. Consensus is a very vague term, but it probably means somewhere around three quarters. I would not personally consider 61% to be a consensus. They got 44% that, in my view, doesn't represent a clear majority. Puerto Rico may be the only place where they count votes of people who didn't vote. Nor was it transparent. People didn't understand, and that is not the way. If you truly, seriously, honestly want to deal with this issue once and for all, it has to be an open, inclusive, transparent process. And in Puerto Rico, they're very good at grabbing on to any misstep to destroy whatever the result was. And in the same day, my opponent was elected governor with the same votes and the same voters that voted against the present territorial status and for statehood. So don't tell me that what the voters did in one ballot is valid and what they did in the other ballot is not valid. Either both are valid or both are invalid. For the first time ever, more than half of the population, 54% of the American citizens living in Puerto Rico, told the world that they don't want Puerto Rico to continue being a territory of the United States, that they aspire to more. Yeah, in the first part, they decided whether they wanted to be for this, that, or the other. And in the second part, they decided to simply, that there was no definition there that satisfied them. So they said, majority said they don't like the colonial rule of Puerto Rico. Good, they agreed with me. But they never said, 
that they wanted, statehood as their option. And then when asked to choose between the three options we have other than uh, the current status, they overwhelmingly chose statehood. When you get a manipulated, fabricated plebiscite in Puerto Rico, which means absolutely nothing, because uh, the plebiscite wasn't anything that the United States of America had uh, any relationship to. The ballot um, was designed uh, pursuant to law by the elected representatives of the people of Puerto Rico. The plebiscite was supported by the President of the United States and by congressional leaders. So from the federal point of view, this was a legitimate exercise of self-determination for the people by the people of Puerto Rico. So they had a plebiscite and then they said, oh, now let's take these, how would I say it? These results and manipulate them to fabricate a false majority for statehood. Some in Puerto Rico say, well, wait, there were a lot of blank ballots. Well, blank ballots in Puerto Rico's legal electoral system are not counted. Well, they're not counted anywhere uh, in America. It's a form of expression and you respect it, but it's very hard to even determine what the blank ballot is all about. By the way, there were more votes for statehood than for the yes, than for the current status. So that's a fact already. That's why the next step, in my view, is for Congress to basically lay out the terms of statehood for the people of Puerto Rico and ask them to accept uh, statehood for the island. If they do, in a, in a democratic vote, then Congress should uh, admit Puerto Rico as a state. I understand what the statehooders are up to, but they're not going to prevail. They can't prevail on the Congress of the United States to authorize. The other thing, it seems like a contradiction because the President of the United States says he's offering them two and a half million dollars so they can celebrate a plebiscite and that then they can come back with some others. So which one is it? Are they with the President or against the President? I thought Perlisi was in the Democratic Party. But wait a minute, the statehooders, one moment they're Democrats, another moment they're Republicans. That has done well for them maybe uh, in the Congress of the United States in the past. I don't think it's gonna bode well for them in the future. What's important is that the ma clear majority of people in Puerto Rico rejected the present status. Now we have a vote, a vote that even those who oppose statehood or those who support doing nothing in action have to admit that that vote took place and that vote should be respected. That plebiscite failed in every aspect. They failed that test. Senate committee hearings. On August 1st, 2013, 93 days after Pierluisi presented his Statehood Resolution Act, the presidents of Puerto Rico's main political parties went to Washington to make declarations on the Congressional Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, which is in charge of Puerto Rico. During those hearings, the new elected governor sat next to his rival resident commissioner and Independence Party president, Ruben Berrios, and the three offered very different interpretations about the results of the plebiscite. And this morning, the committee is going to hear testimony on the results of last November's vote on Puerto Rico's political status and on the president's response. Identifying the most effective means of assisting the Puerto Rican economy depends on resolving the ultimate question of status. This debate over status needs to be settled. The 2012 status referendum was crafted by the statehood party, then in power in Puerto Rico to force an artificial majority for statehood. The U.S. will only act to decolonize Puerto Rico when it has no other alternative. It is therefore to us, up to us Puerto Ricans, to create the political crisis that will compel you to act. 54% said no, and 46% said yes. Now it has transmuted itself into tyranny. To the extent that the people of Puerto Rico ever consented to this status, such consent has been withdrawn. Commonwealth wasn't there. Co co Commonwealth cannot be defined as the current territorial status. That's a mistake. Uh, because the Commonwealth territorial is a question of law. I cannot call the United States of America the empire of the West because it's a mistake. I cannot put a place in the ballot, Commonwealth independence and federal taxes and losing Olympic Committee and losing our national identity because that does the name of statehood. In my reading of this ballot, it's fairly clear that the voters rejected Commonwealth status. Commonwealth was there? Senator? That gives us 
three remaining choices. Let's say, for the sake of argument, that Commonwealth and what they call current territorial status is the same, and we have to exclude that. Statehood lose in 93, in 98, in 67, and we are not proposing to exclude statehood because they lose. Of those who chose an option, 61% voted for statehood. The State Elections Commission so certifies as well. The result of the second question was neither clear nor irrefutable. Statehood rallied 44.4%. Statehood obtained 45% of ballots cast. Many of us ask the populares to cast the ballots blank. Those blank ballots do nothing to detract from the main point, which is that a majority of voters reject, reject territory status, a supermajority favors statehood among the alternatives, and more voters want statehood than any other status option. Puerto Rican statehood is contrary to U.S. national interest. You must ask yourself whether you wish the U.S. to continue as a unitary federal state, a pluribus unum, or rather become a multinational state ruled by the motto, a pluribus duo. What Puerto Ricans want is a true self-determination process, not political games. Now that the plebiscite has been held, it's clear to me that a majority of Puerto Ricans do not favor the current territorial status as evidenced by the first question on the ballot. Rejection of the current territory status last November leaves Puerto Rico with only two options, statehood under U.S. sovereignty or some form of separate national sovereignty. The result of the second question, however, is not as clear to me, nor is it certain that any of the valid status options would receive a majority vote. It seems that this will just go round and round some more. On December 13th, 2013, a year after the plebiscite, the people of Puerto Rico received this letter from the Senate committee. The letter reads, Your testimony and that of the other party presidents at the hearing confirm the results of the first question on the November ballot. A majority of Puerto Ricans do not support the current relationship with the United States. The testimony also showed that there were no agreements on which other status options are available to Puerto Rico or on what process should be used to resolve the status issue. As a result, President Barack Obama included in his budget, which was approved by the House and Senate, $2.5 million so that Puerto Rico can celebrate a fifth plebiscite. On July 16, 2014, Puerto Rican Governor Alejandro García Padilla announced plans for a new status vote to be held by 2016. This would be the first federally sponsored plebiscite in Puerto Rico's history. This time, Puerto Rico should have a definite say in what the island's status should be. I wish nothing more than to solve the status issue in Puerto Rico. I think it's time to embark on a journey of reinvention for the island. The era of the multinational state may be afoot. And if that's not a possibility, Let's move on and demand our sovereignty. But even after every last ballot has been collected and counted, it is ultimately up to the United States to determine how this conversation will end. Puerto Rico can have as many votes as it wants. Nothing can happen without an answer from the United States. Until then, Puerto Rico will forever remain the last American colony. You have an opportunity to join the conversation. Visit our site at thelastcolony.com. Let us know how you would vote on the status debate and share your thoughts. Vote now. <laughs>